Uh, I'm Darcy Sonier. I am the Public Relations Manager here at the Masson Public Library, and I welcome all of you tonight. I am also a very proud member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And on behalf of my sister daughters, we want to say thank you for your service to every veteran in this room. <coughs> I don't think this man needs an introduction because he's been talking to everybody. I think you <laughs> already know him, but this is Brian Bowman. <laughs> and he is from the SAM Center. And he is going to talk to us tonight about the history of Arlington National Cemetery. So, so uh, oh, thank you. my name is Brian Bowman. <laughs> I'm the president and founder of the SAM Center Serving Area Military and Veterans, uh, just down the road and everything. Uh, I was asked to speak, but I was given the, I could speak on whatever topic I wanted. Was that about six months ago or yeah, so? Yeah, it was. Uh, so I was like, well, I usually have to speak on veterans benefits or talking about the SAM Center or something like that. Um, I decided to speak on Arlington. Uh, what authority do I have of speaking there? None really. I've just uh, been there a lot. Uh, so I was there for the Juneteenth uh, celebration. Uh, it was that June 19th of this, first, uh, this past year, the first federal holiday. I was there, I took part in the ceremony at Arlington House on Juneteenth. Uh, I was there September 19th. I was there two weeks ago. What was it? Uh, two Thursdays ago. Uh, I'm sorry, this past Thursday. And then I was there yesterday. Uh, so it's uh, a lot of times when they have events going on out there, I'll fly out to take part in special events and everything. Uh, so right now what's going on is, uh, does anyone know what's going on at Arlington with the special? They're putting flowers, they're putting flowers along the trail. Yes, why? It's the anniversary. Yes. Anniversary. It's the 100th anniversary of the Tomb of the Unknown. Uh, so a lot of people, uh, a lot of our federal holidays, if you think about it, uh, when they're veterans related, they actually kind of go back to Arlington. And Veterans Day is no exception. Uh, because when they're, you see I'm skipping ahead, I'm not even talking about the slides of this. But uh, so with Veterans Day, uh, which was Armistice Day, uh, they put the Tomb of the Unknown in, actually, on uh, November 11th, 2021. So this is the 100th anniversary. They're allowing you to lay flowers at the uh, base of it. Uh, you can walk across. No one's been able to walk across in almost 100 years. Uh, so I was there at eight o'clock in the morning. I was one of the first people to walk across. And uh, even though I didn't have a later time slot, I got there at four o'clock so I could be there for the last changing, uh, well, they still change it throughout the night, but the last public changing of the guard. And I laid flowers again at the end of the ceremony and everything. So I took part in it at the beginning of the day, uh, one of the first ones, and then I took part in it in the evening as well, uh, which is just really an emotional experience. When you think about it, it's there to recognize all soldiers. Now it is the 1,000 plus that were unidentified through World War One uh, that they're really recognizing, but uh, I think anyone who's been there, anyone who's laid a wreath there, you're really there to recognize all soldiers and all sailors and coasties and merchant marines and how we have that. So, sorry to kind of talk a little bit about, and our Arlington is honoring all veterans uh, going there. Uh, key points, actually, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Arlington Estate, the early burials, uh, Arlington National Cemetery, Freedman's Village, James Parks, the Tomb of the Civil War Unknowns, Memorial Day, Tomb of the Unknown. I'm not going to talk about John F. Kennedy. I didn't put him on here. And the future of Arlington, uh, which there's a couple of things really cool that's going on. Not a whole lot of people know about and everything. Uh, but I uh, met the chief of staff at the Air Force Memorial when I was out there last month. And I was walking across the Air Force Memorial talking about that and everything. So as we get started, does anyone have any questions going through? All right. You don't mind it's death by PowerPoint? I might walk around and talk while I'm going here. Uh, but like going into the beginning, Arlington Estate, uh, when you're talking about that 1,100 acres, it was 2,000, uh, but 1,100 acres. 
of the Arlington estate was actually falls back into George Washington's grandson. A lot of people talk about Robert E. Lee and everything, uh, where it, it was actually never going to file into title as far as ownership of Robert E. Lee. It was uh, Custis's daughter, uh, Mary Lee, and then the eldest son is how the will was set up. That's very important later on in life, how the will was set up, uh, because the Lees after the war, they, Robert E. Lee never went back to the estate. Okay. Um, however, they also never filed a grievance or filed anything in the court cases. It was their son that actually did that and everything. So, yeah. What's that? I don't understand what you just said. Was this George Washington's family's property and the Lees? Yeah. Lived so there? George Washington's grand adopted grandson. So he didn't have children. Grandson. Yes. Okay. That's where you get into uh, John Custis, which was John Custis's uh, son. Uh, their son, George Washington Park Custis and Mary Lee Fitzett lived at the Arlington house at that time and everything. Robert E. Lee lived there and it is the Robert E. They consider it the Robert E. Lee state and the memorial. But in the will, he was never set to inherit it. It actually went to his wife and the property was owned by his wife. And then at her death, it would go to her eldest child. So even if uh, Robert E. Lee survived his wife, it, the estate would still at that point in time transfer to their child and not to them. Where that gets important in the end is uh, Lee's, Robert E. Lee's son sued the federal government and actually won in the Supreme Court and actually won title to the property and the federal government would have had to disinter all of those remains and everything. The reason why he was able to do that was based on the will. The will transferred title of property into his name, and then he was the primary heir based on the will. So it's kind of an odd thing if you think about it. Uh, so George Washington's name, the, the Arlington House was built as a memorial for George Washington. And uh, Custis, actually put all of the uh, Washington treasures in the Arlington house. And we'll talk about that and everything. So do you think growing up that it was Robert E. Lee estate yeah. and mansion? At one point in time, it ended up uh, being, it, it is a memorial to Robert E. Lee, the house is and everything. But the house sits on Mount Washington, which was considered Mount Washington. And it was actually the property of the grandson of George Washington. And then his daughter inherited it with his death and everything. That's actually what I'm going to talk about is a lot of things that people uh, get wrong. And quite honestly, with uh, Arlington, which is the Arlington house. Uh, anyone know what the Arlington house is made out of? In there? So the Arlington house is actually a brick house. Uh, so they didn't have money to actually have the marble and sandstone that you see this big, beautiful marble and sandstone. It's actually a brick house with a cement overlay and it's painted. So it's massive cement. Uh, so all of these, the columns, all these columns, everything here is actually brick. They're heavy, thick brick walls and it's an overlay of uh, cement and then it's painted. And the reason they did that was in Washington, DC, you can look up and see the house and anyone across in the 1800s could see the house, but there's no way of telling that it wasn't marble and it wasn't sandstone. And it's just, they had built it in that manner and everything. If you go to the back of the house, the back of the house is very common in plain and everything. It's the front of the house. And that's because from DC, you look on and everything. It's a very strategic point and really to place and look. Uh, most of the plantation, was not farmed. So the Arlington estate was not farmed. They used it as more of like a British estate where they were not farming the land. Uh, who actually farmed more of it uh, was the slaves. The slaves actually had their own plots of land that they farmed and actually took the produce in to DC and sold and everything. Uh, now across the river, they did have the Custis family. George Washington Custis had lots of property. He, 
owned several plantations that they did farm. However, this was more of a gentleman's uh, plantation uh, where they did more hunting and everything and had a park in front of it and everything. I may have a photo, I think, on here of it. Okay, so this is uh, Mariana Randolph Custis Lee. When you're talking about the Rose Garden, uh, the importance of the Rose Garden was <clears throat> she always uh, tended the garden with her mom and uh, her sisters and everyone. Uh, she is actually the one who had title to the property and it was transferring from her to her eldest son. Uh, a lot of people talk about that the Lees never came back. That's not true. She did come back. She never exited the carriage though when she came back. Uh, one of the freed slaves brought her some water and she was in tears and everything when she saw it because what she came back from their grand estate was there's a freedman's village that was already built. There were three military bases built on the land and they took, at that point in time, they had taken her uh, rose garden and they have the tomb of the unknowns, the civil war unknowns in the center and around the outside are graves. Now, originally that wasn't the case with the burials there, but they ended up putting it all the way around there and everything. Does anyone know who the original burial was at Arlington? Does anyone? Huh. So I'll, I'll talk about that here in a little bit and everything. Um, so Arlington House, uh, this is an old map and everything. Uh, and when we look at Arlington House, I can get this pointer thing. Oh, oh, hold on. Apologize. There we go. <clears throat> there it is. Oh, it's not. <laughs> anyway, uh, the Arlington House is right here. Uh, key part about Arlington House uh, with Robert E. problem with Robert E. Lee and the Lee family having it and everything. It's the strategic point you can hit anywhere in Washington, D.C. at that point in time. When the Civil War started, if you had the large cannons of the day on top of at the Arlington House, you could actually hit any spot in D.C. So they could have hit the Capitol building from there and everything. Fighting was only going on about 25 miles uh, during the Civil War, uh, just about 25 miles, 30 miles from there. Uh, General Lee never made it back. Uh, he was very well aware of the view. Uh, and that's the reason why they built it there. Uh, the Arlington House is because everyone from DC could see it and everything. When the Civil War came out about, hey, that great view is also a tactical view as well on Washington, DC. Okay, uh, Arlington and the Civil War. Uh, the old cemetery is considered uh, section 27. It's the colored cemetery. Uh, what many people don't realize about Arlington National Cemetery, Arlington National Cemetery, uh, in the first days before it became a national cemetery, it wasn't segregated. Uh, and the initial graves were a half mile from the house. Uh, it was based on need. Uh, so when they started bur burying the Civil War dead there, there's a two month period, I believe, uh, where they were burying them, but they were a half mile away from Arlington House. Uh, they actually picked the furthest corner down uh, so that it wouldn't interfere. And the other part about it is, guess who's living at Arlington House? The Union officers. The Union officers didn't want those graves by them. It ended up, which I'll show you a little bit later, it ended up being a battle uh, between several different factions of the Union of where they were gonna put those because they just needed space. They needed a place to uh, bury people. The lower corner ends up being the graves. Uh, Chrisman was buried May 1864, but it doesn't actually become a cemetery June 15th, 1864. Uh, so there was a month period where they're burying individuals at Arlington, but it's not considered a national cemetery. The day it becomes a national cemetery, um, <laughs> the other two cemeteries in Washington, D.C. close because they were already past capacity. Uh, so the day that Arlington opens up, the other uh, cemeteries in D.C. Uh, close down because of the Civil War dead, because the battles are going on right there. They're bringing everyone into Washington, D.C. Uh, for medical attention and everyone that's dying at the hospitals and being buried and everything. The other people who are buried at uh, 
Arlington are the people who couldn't afford a burial. Uh, so you had your uh, Civil War dead, uh, and then you had individuals, uh, African Americans, uh, and just regular civilians that could not afford uh, burial. They petitioned the federal government, and they're buried in Arlington. They're mostly buried right there, Section 27. Okay. Once it hit that it was a national cemetery, it became segregated, and then uh, Caucasians were buried in another section. Uh, section 27 became the African American Cemetery. Uh, Chrisman, and there's several others that were buried prior to that still remain in that cemetery. It's probably the least visited part of the cemetery. Uh, Freedman's Village uh, would later become part of the cemetery as well. Okay. Uh, I should have. So, uh, first military burial was not Chrisman. He gets credit for being the first military burial in uh, Arlington. The first military burial is actually First Lieutenant George Washington Park Custis, uh, buried October 1857 in Section 13 next to Mary Lee Custis. Uh, so when you hear people talk about, well, they buried them so the leaves would never return because there would be bodies in the ground and everything, uh, guess what? There was already several bodies in the ground. Uh, the Custis family was buried there. Mary Randolph was buried there. Uh, at that point in time, uh, First Lieutenant George Washington Custis was, had been buried. Mary Custis, they put this oak tree in. They planted it at the time of their burial. It's still sitting there. So uh, it's still growing up, pushing and everything. Uh, but he was the first military officer to be buried in the Arlington Estate Grounds, and he's also uh, for a service member. Um, James Parks was the individual who dug the grave. Uh, James Parks is the only known man to be born on, on the Arlington Estate and buried on the Arlington Estate, uh, which is really cool. He was a slave. Uh, his well, entire life until he was freed at the end, but he never left. He stayed in Friedman's village and uh, stayed there till the end of his life. Uh, they actually petitioned the Secretary of Defense. He got approval for burial. He is not in the colored section, though. He is across uh, the cemetery and everything on the wall that's near the Air Force Memorial. Uh, so they put him on the other side. What's really strange about his uh, grave and everything is he looks at the Confederate Memorial. Uh, so the Confederate Memorial sits right here. The circle of Confederate graves are right here. Uh, James Parks is right here off to the side. And uh, Uncle Jim is constantly looking on him. Them. Uh, he conducted Christmas burial. He cr conducted most of the burials in uh, Arlington. Uh, so in those beginning ones, when the Union took over, he stayed there. Uh, he was one of the people who stayed there uh, working the plantation, helping and everything. He ended up digging the graves. Uh, Friedman's Village came up. He stayed there as well. Uh, he farmed and everything. A lot of the history of Arlington actually comes from him. Uh, they did extensive interviews with him, which you can find online and everything. There was a reporter. Uh, he was up there in age, but there was a reporter who came up to him, and they talked for days and everything. Uh, from the Custis burial on the children, uh, what they liked, disliked, all of that, uh, things that how were things were placed in the plantation, all of that actually came from James Parks, who was a freed slave, and everything. And he never ventured far from Arlington, and he uh, ended up being buried there as well. Uh, so, what year did he die? I don't know the answer to that. Well, I mean, approximately. <laughs> August 21st, uh, 1929. Okay. So, yep. Uh, so it is uh, it's an interesting, respectful, kindly old Negro, born a slave at Arlington House Estate about 1843, died Arlington County, Virginia, August 21st, 1929. Uh, he belonged to George Washington Park Custis proprietor of Arlington Estate from 1781 to 1857. Uncle Jim lived and worked at Arlington practically the whole of his long and useful life. In appreciation of his faithful service, 
The Secretary of War granted special permission to bury his mortal remains in this national cemetery. I think they could have done a little better with that. I mean, could have probably done a little better uh, with that. Um, but uh, if you go on Larrington's page, there's several pages dedicated just to him. And all of the interviews that were connect, uh, conducted with James Park, you, they, they were transcribed and they're available as well online. Uh, it's a really great story to kind of read and learn about uh, because he actually talks about the slave life and everything. When they redid the slave quarters behind Arlington House, a lot of that came from his wording and everything. So how the kitchen set up with the one on two floors and everything, it came by the descriptions that James Parks gave in those interviews. Uh, so a lot of the history on how they, uh, they were redoing Arlington House and slave quarters came from him. The first civilian burial uh, was Mary Randolph. Uh, so she was related to the uh, Custis family. She was actually buried on the grounds in 1828. Uh, she's better known. She wrote the first cookbook. So uh, first cookbook that was written in the United States, mass produced. Uh, the author is actually buried on uh, the grounds of Arlington. If you go uh, outside uh, the Arlington house, uh, go off to the left and then kind of down a little bit, that's where she's buried. I mean, she's within 30 yards of the house. Uh, she's uh, one of the closest burials to the house there and everything. All right, and the reason we have the National Cemetery is actually the uh, spring offensive of 1864. Uh, all of the wounded were taken back to Washington, D.C. They were being treated in Washington, D.C. The cemeteries just had ran out of space. Uh, they had multiple uh, unknowns. So if you go to the other cemeteries in Washington, D.C., uh, you'll see a lot of five unknown buried here, six unknown buried here. Uh, they just didn't have room. So they were just mass graves and everything. Uh, the day that uh, Arlington, uh, the Arlington became a national cemetery, the other two cemeteries closed. Uh, and this is actually the Arlington estate uh, at the time. You can see Arlington House is up here, okay? It was the further corner is the section 27. This comes up to be Freedman's Village. Uh, you see, none of this is actually farmland. Uh, this was done more for hunting and everything. It was a plantation, uh, considered a plantation. Uh, however, that part of the estate uh, was not farmed and everything. It was across the road uh, that was and everything. So uh, a lot of uh, the southern, was this the southern portion, uh, when Freedman's Village was there, the churches, the old African-American churches still stand. Uh, many of the individuals <coughs> in Freedman Village, if you were a freed slave and you were in Freedman's Village, and you had means, you were actually buried at your church and everything. Uh, so you would not be, even at that point in time, uh, the slaves would not be buried at Arlington unless they had no money, no means, and everything. Uh, the beginning of the National Cemetery, it really was considered almost deplorable uh, to be buried there, and families like tried to save the money, and then they would disinter the remains, bring the remains home, and rebury them. Uh, in those first few years and everything. Uh, same thing, uh, it was a segregated uh, cemetery in that section 27, there are thousands of African-American graves and everything in that area and everything. Um, the Custis home when the cemetery is born is still a military base. Uh, it, this kind of picture of them. So it's considered a military base, the officers there did not want the cemetery in that area. The officers who were staying there did not want the cemetery in this area. However, uh, Secretary Santon and me both did. Uh, and I'm gonna read this because this is kind of powerful statement. It's kind of like the prelude to everything. Santon's the Secretary of War at the time and the National Republic wrote, the powers that be have been induced to appropriate 200 acres immediately around the house of General Lee on Arlington Heights for the burial of soldiers dying in the army hospitals of this city. 
The grounds are undulating, uh, handsomely adorned, and in very respectful respect, admirably fitted for the sacred purpose to which they have been dedicated. The people of the entire nation will one day, not very fast, far distant, heartily thank the initiators of this movement, this and the contraband establishment, their righteous use of the estate of the rebel General Lee, and will never dishonor the spot made venerable by the occupation of Washington. So uh, that was written in 1864 about it. And you think about the greatness that Arlington is now. And uh, I'm sure they were very happy because the decision, uh, Lee still had a lot of friends in the Union uh, that they fought together with. Uh, the military officers fought back. Uh, Meeks pushed back. Uh, one of the things uh, was the officers, uh, some of them thought that the Lee family would still come back to Arlington. That's when they started uh, the burials. Uh, 26 burials were uh, buried around, uh, conducted around the perimeter of the Rose Garden uh, that were close to it. Uh, there was still a fight where they did not want the burials right there again because it's a military headquarters and we were burying individuals there and everything. Uh, and, uh, this is actually the statement by uh, Quartermaster Meigs and everything on, again, they were afraid the Lees would come back and they wanted to make sure that they would not come back at that point in time. Okay. And there is Meigs. He chose to be buried there as well. Uh, so a lot of your union generals decided to be buried on uh, Lee's property. Uh, even before it was fashionable, uh, his son uh, was buried there first. His son was a casualty of war, of the Civil War. He was buried there first, and then he was buried uh, along with them. Uh, a big part of kind of the old... Does anyone know who Chief Justice Taney is? Okay. He ruled over a Supreme Court that was a Southern-based Supreme Court. And seven of nine justices were uh, from the South. Five of those justices owned slaves. Dred Scott comes up to that Supreme Court. What do you think the decision of five a majority slave owners, okay, and slave-owning uh, families? So seven of them were slave owning family, uh, they're from the South. Five of them actually owned slaves. And uh, he made the statement, uh, the court ruled that people of African descent are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges uh, which that instrument provides for and secures the citizens of the United States. Uh, pretty much, Ensuring slavery, that's what brought about the Civil War and everything. Um, Arlington, if you go across Arlington, it is full of messages in the afterlife. And uh, uh, this is not this is not uncommon uh, with it, uh, but he's how he said, uh, I think I just kind of went through this, uh, the five owned slaves, seven of nine, uh, the decision played a war on the uh, war. African-American graves at Arlington. Okay, they were first originally pine posts. Uh, they're marked as citizen civilian. A lot of the freed African-Americans buried at Arlington, uh, thousands of them are marked citizen. The reason why they're marked citizen is Roger Taney's ruling. So he was alive to see burials at Arlington where the freed African Americans were called citizens and everything, permanently placing them as citizens of the United States. Miles uh, Taney would die uh, like a year and a half later. Uh, and then Meigs, to further ensure, uh, he didn't think it was enough uh, that they had the burials going around. Uh, the original Tomb of the Unknowns is sitting in the old Rose Garden. 2,111 unknown soldiers were buried in there. So that tomb houses 2,111. They're the old uh, Rose Gardens 
uh, Arlington. So if you ever get a chance, you're visiting the Tomb of the Unknown, uh, also visit the Tomb of the Unknowns, uh, because the entranceway is still with the bushes and everything. They still trim it a lot the same manner, uh, but they have 2,100 unknowns there. Uh, that were from the Civil War. There was two main battles that was from and everything. But that was to really ensure that the Lee family would not come back. Uh, this is a picture of Friedman's Village. Uh, this actually sits on uh, cemetery grounds. If you take a lot of tours, they'll tell you that no one from Friedman's Village is buried uh, in the historic Section 27. Uh, <laughs> that's not exactly true if you look at the roster of individuals buried and where they're from and where they died. A lot of them died at uh, the Friedman's Hospital, and uh, they actually were buried in Arlington. So who knew that we had thousands of slaves, freed slaves buried at Arlington? At one, one? Yeah, I heard you. Yeah. At one point in time, freed slaves actually outnumbered uh, soldiers at Arlington and everything. Uh, so it, it was just, and that's just because of the, what it was as a cemetery. I mean, it was considered a pauper cemetery. Uh, the greatest thing that happened, and this is due to veterans, and really due to uh, veterans coming there, is they started having the ceremonies in the front of it and everything. The people came there to mourn. I mean, they came there to mourn their loss. And uh, it, you t t the least among us, this was considered the least among us of cemeteries, and it ended up being the greatest cemetery in the world. So it's just kind of, it's one of those novelties surrounding Arlington uh, that it, it continues to expand. It's just an absolutely beautiful location. Um, Friedman's Village would later dissolve. Uh, the, I find this interesting because Arlington sees, uh, the government sees the land uh, for $26,800. They bought it at auction for $26,800. The government was the only bidder. Uh, the court would overrule that, however, <coughs> Uh, the individuals uh, that were living in Freed's, uh, Friedland's Village got $75,000 for their properties and everything. The government built the properties and everything, uh, but when they were moved out and everything, uh, the federal government paid them $75,000 when they closed it in 1900. Uh, earlier, I was talking about the how the, we were talking about the will and testament, how that was important. Uh, so after uh, Mary Anna. Uh, Randolph Custis Lee passing, George Washington Custis Lee uh, became the heir to Arlington and everything. Uh, in 1874, uh, uh, George Washington Custis Lee petitioned Congress uh, for the Arlington estate. Of course, they said no. Uh, April 1877, he sued the, for the estate's return. Uh, he prevailed in 1879. Uh, the federal government uh, appealed. In 1882, the Supreme Court ruled in Lee's favor. Uh, the estates were to be changed back over. The forts were to be torn down. Uh, Friedman Village was to be torn down as well. And all of the remains were to be removed from the property. The wheels of justice didn't move any faster back then than they did not. They did not. So you got to think of how long that took him. Yeah. Uh, but he did win. And then... At, he recognized what it would do and everything. He sold the property back to the federal government for $150,000. Mm -hmm. Who received the original auction payment for the $28,000 or $26,000? The federal government. <laughs> so they paid it to themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's a lot of argument if that was a legitimate sale or not. Uh, the federal government was the only bidder. Uh, so the federal government was the only bidder on the property at that point in time. Well, the federal government had already started and built Friedman's Village. They'd already, uh, they were already encompassed in the Arlington House. Uh, they were already building uh, the forts there. They'd already done all that work to the property. Uh, so then it was up for auction. The federal government won it and everything. They actually, because uh, the court ruling is, the government did, again, ill deeds catch up to you. Uh, they required uh, the lease to come back and pay the tax payment, the property taxes in person, because they couldn't come back and of course they would be arrested. Uh, they couldn't come back and pay them in person. That's the reason why they seized the property and everything. 
Uh, but a lot of your rulings now, uh, when you're talking about police powers, separation of federal and state powers, actually go back to this ruling and everything. Uh, so if you want to look up something that's interesting, look up Lee uh, versus the U.S. government, uh, the police protections, all of that actually stem from this ruling as well and everything. This ruling was used in many other future Supreme Court rulings and everything, uh, which Arlington has had such a role in our national history since day one in so many ways that people don't really imagine including the origin of veterans there. Uh, so a lot of the fanfare around, this is actually Armistice Day. Uh, Armistice Day was celebrated. Um, the Tomb of the Unknown after the war, 11-11, 11th hour, 11th day, uh, Armistice is signed and everything. Uh, this, oh, this is when I was there in September. Uh, so it's signed, the British, uh, they inter a uh, unknown Britain. The French do the same thing, okay? Uh, we're there, we have not done this. Uh, state Senator puts forward to inter an individual. Uh, he put forward originally to do it on Memorial Day. Arlington, there was an argument on location and stuff. Arlington was not originally uh, one of the ideas, but then it ended up becoming, and it ended up becoming the location. At that point in time, this was actually flat and everything. There's several things that were different about this, uh, but this was flat uh, just after they entered the unknown and people were having picnics and everything on that property. And they were using uh, the marble to actually have a picnic and everything. Uh, so they ended up putting a fence up. Civilians ended up guarding it. Uh, then the military uh, started taking over guarding it. And then now we guard it 24 seven these guys even when they're told to come in in the middle of a hurricane they stay out there and everything uh, for right now uh, what's going on the last couple days with laying the flowers and everything around with the 100th anniversary uh, so this is the only time the Sentinel is actually guarding the back side uh, the Sentinels also always guarded the front side now the Sentinel is guarding the back side I have a video of the changing of the guard is actually happening over here in the guard shack right now and everything. So they come across and instead of the, the procession that you see back and forth, it's going off on right next to that shed where they call and change in. Uh, this is all up. You can walk across and uh, they have a kind of a fencing and then you lay the flowers there. They laid the flowers around it to kind of make a wreath going around it. Uh, if you see it online or I may have a photo of it in here as well and everything. But by placing it on Armistice Day and everything, and the ceremonies and the revelry that happened around that time, 90,000 people come to Arlington to celebrate the Tomb of the Unknown on that first year when they place it in uh, 2021. They have 90,000 come. Uh, so that is actually the precipice that we have Veterans Day uh, from that. Uh, this is actually a history of the two and the unknown. I stole this from their PowerPoint and everything. Uh, so we'll never have another unknown uh, for any of you guys that have recent service members. We get our DNA, they swab us and everything. Uh, so that we'll never have another one. Vietnam War. Uh, World War I selection was almost double blind. Uh, so the World War I unknown, uh, we don't know if it's African-American, Native American, uh, Caucasian. We don't know anything about that uh, because they uh, selected several individuals. Uh, they disinterred the remains. Uh, they put them in coffins. Uh, then uh, the sergeant came in and he led, uh, laid a thing of white roses on the chosen one. And the others were buried over there. There's, they still remain overseas. Uh, so, but based on how they pulled them, because the, our forces, the, our expeditionary forces, made up of multiple races and everything. Same thing with the selection. Uh, so this allowed anyone, no matter who you are, uh, the, as a family member of, uh, they were also came from different battles in different areas. Uh, so no matter who you are as a family member, you can go to that tomb in World War I if your uh, family member was missing and they could be yours 
and everything. That was just the, the great significance of it, is it could be your loved one or your cut loved one could still be overseas and everything. Uh, they ensured that. He put the white roses on the coffin. Uh, the white roses actually came across the ocean on it and they're actually buried with him and everything. Uh, so if you see uh, uh, white roses and a lot of the wreaths and uh, chrysanthemums and I think sunflowers were the other ones that were used at that point in time. But white roses, what was a bouquet of white roses was placed on uh, the casket and those white roses were actually buried inside the casket with the unknown and everything. Uh, oh, should have skipped ahead. This goes to the selection and uh, the laying of the white roses and everything. Uh, so while I was there, I, um, I actually chose a couple of carnations and uh, white roses each time as well, um, laying them at the feet and everything. So uh, that was just to ensure that no one would ever uh, find the, who the person was and everything. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a picture in Europe uh, of the Tomb of the Unknown and uh, just decorate it and everything, dropping stuff off. And this is Arlington, 1921. Can you imagine that throng of people for at that point in time, having to travel <coughs> that distance? Uh, so it's in ceremonies, I think it was second only, uh, don't quote me on this, I think it was second only to uh, the uh, decorations of the graves after uh, the Civil War as far as the number of people. It was over 100,000 came to that and everything. Foreign dignitaries across the world came. It was broadcast, uh, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, uh, just because, again, you had so many Americans that they were unidentified. And this touched the heart of those Gold Star mothers. Uh, what, uh, Laying a wreath. Has anyone laid a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown? Okay. I know you have because I've laid it with you. <laughs> so uh, this is actually, I, uh, last Thursday I was there. Uh, this is the head of uh, the Italian uh, House of Delegates. Uh, he was laying a wreath there. Uh, so the head of the Italian House of Delegates was laying a wreath there at the same time I was there. Um, but you and I can lay one. Uh, all you have to do is go online, reserve the time and everything, and you can go there to pay your respect and lay a wreath. Uh, I've done it with uh, our daughter uh, and uh, my father-in-law back there in the back. Uh, he walked up there with us as well uh, when we laid the wreath. I've done it with uh, honor trips. I did it, uh, took a 29-year-old hospice veteran to Washington, D.C., uh, where his family uh, laid a wreath. Uh, there as well, uh, because he was, uh, at, he only lasted another two months, but he, uh, when we were there, we laid a wreath. Anyone that wants to pay respects to the unknowns can register and lay a wreath. And, uh, do that, plan that ahead with your trip with Washington, D.C. I encourage everyone to do that. Anyone have any questions on that? I think that's a really important process if you're ever going to D.C. Uh, to lay a wreath. Can't wait till my son ever gets old enough. And we'll do that. Yeah. Uh, oh, here. This was uh, this was the evening uh, last night. Uh, so for the closure, I flew out 5.30 in the morning. Uh, went to Arlington yesterday again. And uh, I got back here about 11.30 at night from Cleveland and everything. Uh, so now they're bringing it further around to be a wreath going around. Um, but the whole, that being placed on Armistice Day is actually the onus for the federal holiday that would come a few years later and everything. Uh, oh, sorry. There's me placing it in the morning uh, and then the evening. Uh, these are just kind of a couple of slides uh, with Arlington and the visits. Uh, this is something most people don't know, uh, the Air Force Memorial. Anyone want to take a guess where the air, whose property the Air Force Memorial stands on? Detroit Riots. What? It's not, it's 
A Pentagon property. Fort Myers? What? Fort Myers? Yeah, it's, it's army land. So it's army land, uh, that land in front of it and everything. More specifically, it's National Cemetery land. It is part of it. And when the cemetery expands here in the next two years, these two roads in front and everything here is going to be pushed back and everything. This now becomes part of the National Cemetery. On the back wall where the restrooms are uh, for the Air Force Memorial, uh, there's a road that goes across there. All that fencing is coming up forward. forward. Uh, there's going to be a space for ceremonies and different things. Right now, if you want to have a promotion ceremony or anything on the grounds of Arlington, the only real place to do it is the Women's Memorial. Uh, so a lot of times when people try to walk through the Women's Memorial, it's set up with tables and chairs. And uh, Honor Flight Columbus does their meals there uh, before they come home and everything. Uh, but they're doing it right there in the dead center in the Women's Memorial, uh, right next to the Air Force Memorial. They're going to build that. Uh, this will actually, around the Air Force Memorial, there will be burials here coming up in a couple years. Uh, so you'll see all those roads going away. It's going to be chaos to get there and everything. Uh, the Pentagon's over there. Uh, further up there is the Pentagon. Uh, people do say that if that was there, uh, the plane wouldn't have hit. Well, the plane would have probably went higher and hit it on the other side of the Pentagon coming down, which is actually where the Secretary of Defense was. Uh, so uh, as far as the difference in sides of where the plane, the plane came down right there on 9-11 at an angle and everything. This memorial was planned long before that and everything, uh, <laughs> but this will be National Cemetery and everything. Here in, you visited in 2027, uh, you actually see cemetery grounds going around here and everything. Uh, they're going to actually truck in a ton of dirt because that's going to be rolling hills. Uh, so even the flat areas of Arlington, they've trucked in dirt to make the rolling hills, everything, uh, which is different from Ohio Western Reserve, which you've been to Ohio Western Reserve National Cemetery, where they take out all the dirt and they put the gravel down and everything. Then they put the crypts lining up side by side and then they put the six foot of dirt over top of it and everything. That's not the case in Arlington and everything. In Arlington, where you don't have the rolling hills, they create them and everything. Uh, so, but they create them on the scale that they are interested in and everything. Uh, General Sheridan, I kind of love what he did. Uh, he literally put his marker right there in front of the Arlington house. So if you're down, looking at the Arlington House, you're looking at General Sheridan triumphant over Lee. So when we talk about the messaging and what people did, he put it right there. So if you're looking up at Arlington House, that view that the Custis family absolutely loved and everything, you see Sheridan sitting there staring right back. So, oh, that's me. I finally got to sit in that. It took me 10 years to sit in that chair. They had it open and everything. Uh, because they did a Native American ceremony there uh, yesterday. Uh, the uh, Chief Plenty Coup was one of the individuals who uh, was there in uh, 1921. Uh, so his descendants and some other uh, tribe elders came. Uh, you'll notice the flag. That's actually his ceremonial flag. It's usually inside of uh, the building. Uh, it's spelled wrong. When they made the flag, they spelled his name. They spelled it wrong. Uh, they still utilize it. He used it that day. Uh, and then he left his headdress and his war staff there uh, with the World War I veteran. Part of it is because it could have been a Native American. And then you, they really just don't know who that individual is <coughs> and everything. And today, you see this is a 101-year-old World War uh, II veteran. That was just there with uh, last month. Uh, he cracked his hip like three months, three weeks prior to that. But he had such pride, he walked over four miles uh, the entire time. Uh, but uh, individuals just visiting the graves and seeing the beauty of Arlington and uh, kind of uh, had the best time with him. That's why I have him in there and everything. Because when you're there and you're showing, uh, 
the World War II veterans, the Korean veterans, and he's a Vietnam uh, veteran. Uh, when you're showing them the memorials built for them, there's nothing more special. If you ever get the chance to be a guardian for an honor flight trip, uh, take it. Uh, I've been on 10 of them. Uh, I will go back to even more. Uh, so I couldn't go, uh, couldn't go the same way. So I actually booked my own flight to be a DC guardian uh, this last time and everything. So I could meet them in DC and go around with them and everything. Uh, but the look on their faces when they see the war, World War II veteran, when they see the World, uh, World War II Memorial and the Korean veterans like yourself, sir, uh, the Korean Memorial, uh, they have that torn apart right now. Uh, but uh, that will be finished in the summer of 2022. Uh, they're going to be redoing the Korean Memorial. Uh, and they're actually going you to know, put all the names of the Korean fallen on a wall there. And I've been there where guy swears it was him that was on the wall because they took individual photos of people who were in the Korean War and uh, that either different people submitted them. Some of them were submitted, some of them were just taken from National Archives and Korean veterans can't find their own photo on that wall and everything, but they swear it's their photo and everything going through. Uh, Lincoln, not Abraham Lincoln, his son is there. Oh, I thought I had one of Bobby Brown. Uh, I go there every single uh, time I visit there, I visit Bobby Brown. I'm not the singer, uh, rapper, uh, but there's a Medal of Honor uh, recipient named Bobby Brown, uh, who's buried uh, near the Tomb of the Unknown. Uh, he has eight Purple Hearts. Uh, depending on how you consider decorations, uh, he's actually more decorated than Adi Murphy. Uh, but that's because he had, again, the eight Purple Hearts, the Shingler's uh, Service Cross, uh, Medal of Honor, Silver Star, Bronze Star. Uh, he's buried there and uh, he ended up becoming a janitor at uh, West Point. And uh, he took his own life in 1972, maybe 73. Yeah. Um, uh, but it was the early 1970s <clears throat> he took his own life. Uh, the cadets never knew that he was a Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, there's another Medal of Honor recipient that became a janitor at Air Force. And decades later, one of the cadets was looking at the history, found out they were working with Medal of Honor recipient. Unfortunately, Bobby took his own life. Uh, Cool antidote, two years ago, we were uh, on our way to vacation, uh, on our way down to vacation, we stopped in, uh, in West Virginia. We actually ended up in a town where we were in a railroad museum that actually had a display and everything for Bobby Brown and everything. Uh, he had actually trouble getting interred into Arlington at that point in time. That is it. Does anyone have any questions? What qualifies a veteran to be buried there? Oh, it just changed again. Uh, but it's, it's the easiest way to say is war service. Uh, your Purple Heart, your injuries in war, wartime service. There's other caveats to that. There's different uh, for the crematory wall. Oh, that road, by the way, that road is actually going to be a several mile long crematory wall, uh, Columbarian. Uh, that will stretch uh, for miles. Uh, but there's different uh, rules and they just changed them again. Uh, one of the things is, uh, I don't know why a few years ago, uh, the WASP, the, the female uh, veterans of World War II, uh, they were not considered, they were considered, they were not. Uh, really strange part is you change the rule that they're not considered. There was only like two of them alive and everything where the, now they're being excluded. Uh, but she ended up being buried there and everything. Uh, so those rules, uh, I know they just changed, but uh, I do not qualify. So I'm a 21 year army veteran, but I do not qualify, but I qualify, I retired uh, with deployments. I do not, I qualify under national cemetery, but I do not qualify for Arlington. Mm -hmm. So I went to a burial there for a, a retired colonel from Mass when uh, I was buried there a number of years ago, and I went to that ceremony, that service at Arlington. I just assumed because he was a colonel, retired colonel, maybe that qualified him. Yeah, so he probably had wartime service. He did. Yeah, it's wartime service connection, 100% service connection. Uh, I was there when uh, uh, two of the 13 uh, that died in Afghanistan were buried there. Uh, 
just recently Colin Powell was buried there. Um, you do have citizens who are buried there. If they're high government officials, they can still be buried there. Uh, what you can't see is when you saw the large markers, I don't know if I have any on here. Yeah, oh, means uh, one of them. So these large markers and stuff, you can put your own marker there. Uh, they, uh, you can't do that anymore. That stopped in 2017. Uh, so now if your spouse is buried there, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, she has a large black marker just off to the side of Kennedy. Uh, but yes, she would qualify. She's actually there. Her husband was a lieutenant. He qualified based on service. So he's buried there and he actually has a black marker. Uh, some of the individuals with the greatest monuments in Arlington, uh, it wasn't because they were great generals or stuff like that. It's because they had a lot of money. And they can, because you, you pay for your own memorial, your own marker and the perpetual care. So you can have a general who has next to nothing or you could have really nice one. Uh, John Glenn is right near uh, the Tomb of the Unknowns. Uh, he chose just a regular plane. At that point in time, he could have chosen a different marker. Uh, Colin Powell will have a plane marker, just like everyone else. <clears throat> Is it? Yeah, there must be some, some real exceptions to that. I was at one burial there. Yeah. Okay. I was stationed, I'm in the, I was in the Coast Guard. I was stationed on the Coast Guard 1 and the Coast Guard 2. Yeah. I flew out of Washington National Airport. One of my friends had a son that died. Yeah. He was like a year or two old. And he got buried in Arlington. Because he qualifies based on his father's service. So your child can be buried with you. So it's that same plot. Okay. Uh, the only time you can reserve a plot as well is uh, it, like, let's say uh, I'm a service member, my wife's a service member, we both qualify. Then you can reserve that plot next to them and everything. Same thing at Ohio Western Reserve. So if you ever see a blank spot in Ohio Western Reserve, you can't choose your spot in anything, but if you have uh, someone else who qualifies based on service and you're married to them, you can be buried next to them. Uh, the other option there, and it was probably happening, he's two years old. Uh, what happened is he has his spot there already, and on the backside is the name of the child. Now, if it was prior to 2017, uh, they could actually have just any marker they wanted based on what they could well, afford. Yeah, it would have been like, uh, I was there from 1970 to 76, I was stationed there, so somewhere in the middle of there. And the rules on that just changed a little bit, but you'll never see another uh, marker going like that, uh, where individuals can choose, unless <laughs> Department of the Army changes that, or I'm sure Colin Powell's family wanted a different one, the Department of the Army would make an exception. <laughs> <laughs> so. What's with the, the memorial to the maid? Yes. The USS Maine, what's that about? I remember seeing it there, but. Yeah, so the mast is there. Uh, if you ever go there with someone who, can, the mast is there, the anchor is there, and two of the cannons are there off to the side. If you ever go there with uh, someone who can sing, have them go in there and sing the national anthem when it's open and everything, it actually echoes out of it and everything, so. But that is one of the, the Space Shuttle Challenger memorials there as well. Off to the right there is the Space Shuttle Challenger. It's really close to it. Uh, you have different groups that have uh, memorials that have placed them there. Uh, some, it, and it, the great part about it is First Infantry, you'll come up and they have this little block and that's it and everything. Uh, but it all depends on the money that they raise and they pay. But I think you know that it's, uh, you donate that to the National Cemetery and everything. Uh, so we worked on a memorial on the memorial walkway on the uh, National Cemetery in uh, Ohio Western Reserve uh, for the Corvette Club, and you donate those. So how grand it is, uh, those memorial blocks that you see in different spots is all based on how that association raised the money. So in that association could provide one. So if in 1920, they could only raise so much money and they have it this big, but later they could raise, they have someone who's a billionaire and wants to put a large memorial. They can't because they can only have one. And everything. So. Hey, Brian. Yes. I'm the one who was in charge of that memorial that we put in the yes. walkway. 
and I want to thank you for all the time and effort you helped me do that. It was quite a two-year project, but we made it happen. If you've not been to the Memorial Walkway for the Ohio Western Reserve, we went up Sunday, and they cleaned it all up and took all the shrubs and junk and garbage and stones and everything else. It's a very beautiful. Also, they advertise they have the longest Memorial Walkway in the world because it's the only one that there is. <laughs> no, no, there are more. They, they actually have more memorials there than any other national cemetery in the United States. Uh, so the more donated memorials are at Ohio Western Reserve in Seville. Well, the people call it Red Men's in Seville. Uh, but they have more memorials there in, on that walkway than any other national cemetery in the United States. And quite, uh, a, quite a few of them for Maslow. Yeah, quite a few. Yes. So each organization can submit one, uh, thanking veterans and everything. It can't be an individual's names. And I think part of our fight was uh, there was like different price. We had to change it like a dollar less for right. them to prove it. More $5,000. Yeah, so. To keep the paperwork. Yeah, so we ended up moving it to $4,999. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so outside Arlington, like they're great places. Uh, your World War II Vietnam Korean veterans, uh, they have opened up honor trips. Uh, there's a couple of different options to go see Washington, D.C. for the veterans for free. Uh, honor Flight Columbus doesn't care where you're from. They'll sign up. I was just with a Vietnam veteran from uh, Canton. Uh, I flew to D.C., met them there and everything. It was a Canton veteran that I was a guardian for and everything. Uh, but you can sign up for Columbus. Uh, they take a different route in everything. Uh, and then they have dinner at, they spend a lot more time on the National Mall and a lot more time at Arlington uh, than most of the other ones. Uh, Cleveland Honor Flight didn't go out this year or last year. Uh, they are planning on going out 2022, but they're not going out until the Korean War Memorial opens back up. Uh, that's uh, according to Jacob, who's the president, that he's waiting until the Korean War Memorial opens back up uh, for them to do those trips again. Uh, Wayne Holmes didn't happen because uh, of COVID, but Wayne Holmes honor trip is a three day one. Uh, so that'll actually go out three days. I've gone there a few times. I went there like two weeks after my son was born. <laughs> was that two weeks? <laughs> I think my wife was gonna kill me. Uh, it was just a couple weeks after my son was born. I went on the Wayne Holmes honor trip as a guardian. It's three days and everything. Uh, so, but you take a bus out there and a bus back and everything. Uh, and you see all the memorials at nighttime during the day and you do a whole bunch of extra stuff as well. It's more of a calmer pace and everything, as opposed to like, if you're coming from here to Columbus, you have a two hour drive to get there at four. So you're getting up at 1 a.m. You don't get back in there till 10. Uh, and then you're not getting back up here till after midnight. Uh, but Columbus, the welcome home in Columbus is just unbelievable. Uh, what the, the citizens of Columbus come out and just really, it's just an extraordinary. Anyone have any questions on Arlington? How did I do on that? I'm usually talking about benefits and everything, more of a dry thing. Uh, but I get really excited about Arlington, uh, just, uh, yeah, I've gone down there four uh, times this year. I did, it's not on here. Uh, they did a Juneteenth uh, celebration there. Uh, so I went to Washington, D.C. on the first Juneteenth, no matter what anyone thinks about the holiday, at the National Archives that morning, they put up uh, that declaration from Texas. They had it, they put it up. Uh, so we were like the first people in the world to see it. Uh, we got to go in there. John Hamilton, who's uh, uh, our congressional chief there, uh, got us in there for a uh, tour before they opened and everything. And that document was there. Then we went over to Arlington and just, I just stumbled on the ceremony and they asked me if I wanted to take part in it. And I was like, yes, I will take part in the Juneteenth ceremony at Arlington House. Uh, so I was able to take part in the ceremony there as well. Um, and then yesterday I just flew out. Be a chance to watch on their Facebook page. They have Facebook page or DVIBs. Uh, with the military. Uh, they're live streaming a lot of these uh, presentations and everything. You can still watch the Native American one. If you watch the Native American one, I'm at the 55 minute mark. Uh, the Native American ceremony and the uh, flower laying was at, I think that recording started at like 
eight yesterday morning. Uh, they have a couple other smaller ones. Uh, today, uh, they had a couple recordings that they uh, released. The joint, uh, so there are two main, uh, sorry, there are two main ceremonies that go on at Arlington uh, because of the significance of Veterans Day and the connection with the Tomb of the Unknown. Uh, Veterans Day is always hosted at the amphitheater there as well. Uh, so a lot of people don't, they, they look at that, it's like, why is Veterans Day ceremony having this massive Veterans Day ceremony in Arlington? Uh, well, that's because of November 11th, 1921, and the Tomb of the Unknown, and everything it being placed there, and then so many of the individuals connecting to it. That's how it transformed from Armistice Day to Veterans Day. They have that ceremony there every single year, and the uh, uh, Memorial Day ceremony, which kind of started based on Decorations Day of the families of the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, the children and everything coming and uh, decorating the graves and everything. That's how we, from that, is part of the precipice of Memorial Day, even though they say that the decorations happen in other cities and stuff. But of course, individuals decorate graves uh, of their lost loved ones. Any other questions? All right, that'll finish. Anyone have any questions? All right.